In this video, we want to develop some more properties of the derivative. Uh, for example, if f is differentiable, that is to say that it has a derivative, uh, f prime of x exists at the point, and c is any constant number, then the derivative, so d dx of c times f of x, is just c times the derivative of f of x. So in other words, if you take you know, a number like 2 uh, times f of x, and you're taking the derivative of this, so just to be 2 times f prime of x. So that is, you can factor the constant multiple out of the derivative process. And this is a natural consequence of limit laws. So if we have our constant c, and we take the function c times f, and we want to calculate its derivative, then by the definition of the derivative, this is the limit of the difference quotient, where we're going to take cf at the point x plus h and subtract from it cf at the point x and then we divide everything by h right we have to cancel the h in the denominator if we can right but what it, what does the function cf of a number even mean like if you take you know cf and evaluate it at two what this means is just you're going to take c times f of two you just take the function evaluate the number and then times it you know as an afterthought by this constant and so when you take cf of x plus h, this just means c times f of x plus h. And same thing here, c f of x just means c times f of x. Now this is a constant multiple which could be factored out, right? We can factor it out of the numerator so we get c times f of x plus h minus f of x. This all sits above h as h is going to zero. But as now this is a constant multiple of the limit it could be taken out of the limit process, so it sits out right here. But then this right here is just the derivative of f evaluated at x. And since the function is differentiable, this limit exists and is equal to f prime of x. So taking the derivative with the constant multiple means you can take the constant multiple out. When you combine that with the power rule, that then allows us to calculate some more types of functions. Like take y, y equals 8 times x to the fourth. Well, by this constant multiple rule, if we take y prime, that is, we want to take the derivative of 8 times x to the fourth, by the constant multiple rule, we can take the 8 out, and so we have to take the derivative of x to the fourth, which by the power rule, that's going to be 4x cubed. You bring the coefficient out in front, that is, the exponent becomes the coefficient out in front, and then you reduce the coefficient or the exponent by 1. Then you're going to take 8 times 4, which gives you 32x cubed. That would be the derivative of this function. Uh, how about this one right here? If we want to take the derivative of y, which equals negative 3 quarters times x to the 12th. Well, when we calculate dy dx here, we're going to be taking the derivative of negative 3 fourths x to the 12th, for which we can pull that coefficient out. We get negative 3 fourths. And then we take the derivative of x to the 12th by the power rule. That gives us 12x to the 11th for which then we'll multiply the coefficient that was already there with the new coefficient we got from the power rule. Uh, 4 does go into 12 uh, 3 times. So we get negative 3 times positive 3. We end up with a negative 9x to the 11th as the derivative of this function. Looking at the next one, if we take the derivative here of negative 8t, which we're going to be taking the derivative with respect to t right here. Again, take out the negative 8, then we have to take the derivative of t, which we saw by the power rule. If you take the derivative of just a single variable, you're just going to get back a 1. And so you end up with negative 8 as the derivative. It's a constant here. And so this is something you see very quickly, that since the constant multiples are just you know, just factored out of the process, uh, we kind of can start skipping steps. I mean, the whole point is this process is speed up the calculation, make it more efficient. So when you look at something like y equals 10 times p to the 3 halves, if we take the derivative with respect to p, dy dp, we're going to end up with 10 times, right? Then we take the derivative of p to the negative 3 halves power, which by the power rule gives us 3 halves p to the 1 half power. Where did 1 half come from? Well, 1 half is 3 halves minus 1. And so since you're just going to factor the 10, I'm just going to leave it there. I don't need to do it in two steps. I'm just going to do it all at once. And as 2 goes into 10 five times, and 5 times 3 is 15, we see the derivatives is 15 times p to the 1 half power. So combining these, these derivative rules, we can speed up this process very, very quickly. Uh, how about this one right here? Let's take the derivative of y equals 6 over x which to maybe make it easier, it's better to see this as a power function. So y equals 6 to the x times x to the negative 1. 
So then by the power rule with this constant multiple rule, y prime will equal 6 times negative 1 times x to the negative 2. Remember, we subtracted 1 from the exponent. And so rewriting it back as a reciprocal function, we end up with negative 6 over x squared as the derivative. This constant multiple rule works out very nicely. Now let's combine it with another derivative technique. Uh, this is sometimes called the sum rule, which I don't mean like in Charlotte's Web, this is sum pig. I mean, this is the sum rule, right? Uh, and which tells us that if we take, if we have two differentiable functions, f and g, they're both differentiable at a point, then the derivative of f plus g of x will equal the derivative of f plus the derivative of g. So if you have two functions, f, you know, you have f of x plus g of x, and you want to take the derivative, this will equal f prime of x plus g prime of x. You can separate two functions connected by a sum and take their derivative separately, all right? Um, it's also true, you can do this for differences. If you have f of x minus g of x, uh, and you take its derivative, this will be f prime of x minus g prime of x. The, the proofs of the sum rule and the difference rule are basically the same. Let's look at the argument behind the sum rule just for a moment, because again, f minus g will be handled very similar. So if we have f plus g prime of x, well, by the definition of the derivative, the, that is the derivative is the limit of a difference quotient, this would look like f plus g evaluated at x plus h. Now, this looks like we're supposed to FOIL, but this notation might be a little bit misleading here. We're not multiplying here. The name of the function is f plus g, and the name of the operand we're putting into the function is x plus h. And then we have f plus g evaluated x all over h. Well, what does it mean to have a function f plus g evaluated at number x? It just means evaluate the, evaluate the function at the number f of x, evaluate also the number at the function g, and then add together whatever those outputs are. So when you add together two functions, you're just adding together the output. And so that tells us that f plus g at x is f of x plus g of x. This also tells us that f plus g at x plus h is f of x plus h plus g at x plus h, which when you look at that, it's like, it kind of looks like you distributed x plus h here. So I, I guess it does kind of look like it's a FOIL. I mean, it's not, but it, it, it has the same notational similarities. Now, so we have an f of x plus h plus a g of x plus h minus a, minus a f of x and a g of x, which notice this negative sign was distributed onto the f of x and to the g of x. So if we do distribute that through, we're gonna end up with an f of x plus h, we get a g of x plus h, we're gonna get a minus f of x, and we're gonna get a minus g of x. This all sits above h as h is going to zero. For which I'm then gonna regroup things. Let's put the f's together and let's put the g's together. For which you then see this f of x plus h minus f of x, and then you see this g of x plus h minus g of x in the numerator of our difference quotient. But if you had something like one plus three, and this sits over five, you could break this up into one-fifth and three-fifths. That is, I'm just going to break up this fraction into two fractions. That is to say, this then looks like the limit of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And then we're going to add to that g of x plus h minus g of x all over h. And so these are all sitting inside of this limit. So we're going to, we can broke, we broke up our original fraction into two fractions, which these two fractions are themselves difference quotients. Well, if you take the limit of a sum, right? So we have a, we have a limit here and a sum of two things by limit properties, you can break this into a sum of limits right here. So we get the limit as H approaches zero of F of X plus H minus F of X over H. And we also get plus the limit as h approaches zero of g of x plus h minus g of x all over h. For which when you look at this by itself, hey, this looks like the, the derivative. This is just the definite derivative of f. And since f is differentiable, this limit exists and is equal to f prime of x. Likewise, this here is just the limit of the derivative. Uh, this limit here is the derivative of g. So it's just g prime of x. And so we see here that the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. The Essentially, the identical argument will work with negative signs here. You just have to change all the negatives. So this becomes negative, this becomes negative, um, this becomes negative, this is a negative, this is a negative. You just go through all of this, it becomes a negative, this becomes a negative, this becomes a negative. There's the proof for f minus g as well. And this follows from limit properties that we saw previously in chapter two of our lecture series. Now, I do have to caution you that products and quotients will not 
be so simple. We will actually approach those in the next lecture. Um, I also want to point out that if we take the properties we've learned so far, the power rule, the constant multiple rule, sums and difference rules, we actually have the technique to compute the derivative of any polynomial function. Let me show you how this would work. So here's a perfectly good polynomial function, y equals 6x cubed plus 15x squared. If we take the derivative here, y prime, well, we're going to take the derivative of this function, 6x cubed plus 15x squared, but we have the sum of two terms, 6x cubed plus 15x squared, which by the sum rule, which we learned previously, thanks to Charlotte, we get 6x cubed prime plus... 15x squared prime. We can take the sum of these things separately. And if we have more than two terms, like we'll see in a second, you can just take each the product, that is take the derivative of each term in the sum separately. Then we can take out constant multiples by the constant multiple rule, 6x cubed prime plus 15x squared prime. Uh, and then taking by the power rule, we're going to get 6 times 3x squared, its derivative. And the derivative of x squared will be a 2x and then multiplying things together you get 18x squared plus 30x which is the derivative of this polynomial much simpler than we'd have to do it alternatively of course i think that a lot of this process can be simplified dramatically eventually we'll be we will reach a point where we'll say things like y prime is equal to 6 times 3x squared plus 30x right you'll just kind of multiply the things together you might be like oh 15 times 2x, but you want, and then the next step is multiplying, but many of you will be able to just do this in one line. Y prime is equal to, okay, 6 times 3 is 18 times x squared, we lower the power, and then you get 15 times 2, which is 30, and then you lower the power, you get x. Many of us will be able to very quickly get to the point where the derivative of a polynomial will be a one-liner. This will be basically like a multiple choice question on an exam. When this, you know, comparably on exam two, when you're trying to calculate the derivative of such a polynomial from the definition, would be, probably be one of the hardest problems on that test. You can see the huge advantage we could have from doing the power rule here with these other techniques. Let's take the function p of t equals 12t to the fourth minus 6 times the square root of t plus four uh, over uh, 5 over t, excuse me. It's not a polynomial, but we can make it into something similar to a polynomial. That is, we can make it into a combination, uh, a linear combination, so to speak, of these power functions. And so we get 12t to the fourth minus 6. I'm going to write that as t to the 1 half power. And then for the next one, we're going to get 5 times t to the negative 1. So then when you take the derivative, the derivative of p of t, that is p prime of t, which by the power, we're going to get 12 times 4, which is 48. Lower the power by 1, we get t cubed. The next one, we're going to get negative 6 times 1 half, which is negative 3. Times that by t to the negative 1 half, I lowered the power by 1. And then we're going to get 5 times negative 1. That's actually a negative 5. And then we get t to the negative 2, because again, we lowered the power by negative 1. Trying to resemble the original formula, we're going to get 48t cubed. We're going to get minus 3 over the square root of t. And then we're going to get minus 5 over t squared, which is then the derivative here of p. And so I mentioned I mentioned in this example that this is some type of linear combination of power functions. What do I mean by linear combination? A linear combination is when you take... Uh, you, you take coefficients, you can add coefficients in front of a function, um, and then you can take addition or subtraction. So if you have any functions, you can take like 3 times f of x plus 2 times g of x, maybe like minus 7 times h of x. Uh, this is what's often referred to as a linear combination of the function, a linear combination. Why linear here? Um, well, a linear combination to suggest that when we combine the functions together, the only operations we're using is addition, subtraction, and multiplication by a constant. This is exactly how we build linear functions. So if you like take the linear equation, ax plus by equals c, this would be the, the equation of, of a line. You just take the linear combination of the variables x and y. In three dimensions, if you want to make a plane, which is like the three-dimensional analog of a line, you take ax plus uh, by plus cz, whoops, cz, is equal to d. So a linear combination of your three variables, x, y, and z, forms a plane. And so because of that, the properties we're exploring in this video are often called the linear properties of the derivative. Because a derivative 
Uh, you can, it, it preserves constant multiples. It preserves addition and subtraction. Therefore, when you take the derivative of any linear combination, you can always defer it to taking the derivative of the operand of the summands in that linear combination. And so these are called the linearity properties of the derivative. We're going to find out there are a lot of linear operations in calculus, uh, the derivative just being one of them. What if we want to take the derivative of f of x equals x cubed plus 3 times the square root of x over x? Well, if we want to use these linear properties, like the, the scalar multiples, the addition, subtraction, and the power rule, we're not quite there. But it turns out that with the appropriate algebraic manipulation, we can turn this what looks like a rational expression involving powers and square roots, we can actually turn this into a linear combination of power functions. And the idea is the following. Well, since you have a monomial in the denominator, we can actually break up the fraction into two fractions. So we get x cubed over x, and then we get 3 times the square root of x over x. But the square root of x we could also write as a power function, because when you look at the first expression, x cubed divided by x, I can simplify that just to be x squared. I would love to do that with the second one, which if I recognize that the square root of x is the one-half power, then in fact you can do that. You take the one-half power, subtract from that the first power in the denominator, we'll get x squared plus 3 times x to the negative one-half. We now see, like the previous example, f of x is in fact a linear combination of these power functions. A polynomial is just a linear combination of power functions where the, the powers are necessarily non-negative integers. But taking the derivative of these other linear combinations of power functions is just as efficient. By the power rule, we'll take the derivative of x squared separately, which will be 2x. Then by these rules, we'll take the derivative of the next one. We'll get 3 times negative 1 half times x to the negative 3 halves power. Subtract 1 from negative 1 half, you get negative 3 halves. Uh, combining these coefficients together, we get 2x. We're going to get a minus 3 halves times x to the negative 3 halves, which you could leave that as the derivative. That's perfectly fine. Um, if you want to throw back in, uh, if you want to throw back in, you know, square roots and fractions, you can do that. It really doesn't make much of a difference, but you can do it. Uh, it's more of just a cosmetic thing. 2x minus 3 over 2 times x times the square root of x. You can do something like that. That's appropriate. Or you could, or you could write that last term as the square root of x cubed. There's, a, again, a couple different ways you could write this, all of them cosmetic at this moment. What I mostly would care about as an instructor is whether we can do these derivative calculations correct or not. Can we get from here to here? And can we also take the original expression and write it in a form that's more uh, appropriate for the derivative? Can we prep it for surgery, in a manner of speaking? How about this next one? f of x is equal to 4x squared minus 3x quantity squared. You're going to see there's a slight issue here that since this is squared, um, we don't have a power function. A power function would look like x squared, right? But we have something more complicated than a power function. In fact, we could factor this as like u squared composed with 4x squared minus 3x. We put a polynomial inside of a power function, which doesn't actually make it a power function anymore. Um, what we have to do instead to prep it for surgery, to prep it for differentiation, we need to FOIL this thing out. 4x squared minus 3x times 4x squared minus 3x. If we FOIL this thing out, we'll get 4x squared times itself, which is 16x to the fourth. We'll get 4x squared times a negative 3x, which is a negative 12x cubed. We'll get that again. And for the last term, we'll take negative 3x times a negative 3x, which will be a positive 9x squared. Combining like terms, we end up with 16x to the fourth minus 24x cubed plus a 9x squared. So now we're, we're prepped for surgery. That is, we're prepped for the differentiation. Taking the derivative here, we're going to get 16 times 4, which is 64, right? Lower the power of x by 1, so it becomes 64x cubed. Then for the next one, we're going to take negative 24 times 3, which is negative 72, lower the power by 1 to get x squared. And then lastly, we're going to take 9 times 2, which is 18, lower the power by 1, gives you an x, which then gives us the correct derivative of our function here. For one last example, let's consider finding some tangent lines here of the polynomial function y equals x to the fourth minus 6x squared plus 4. But we want to find the tangent lines for which are horizontal, as you can see illustrated here on the graph. If your tangent line is horizontal, what that means is we're looking for when the derivative is equal to 0. So if we calculate the derivative y prime here, we're going to get 4x cubed minus 12x. And then when you take the derivative of, of course, the four, it goes to zero. And we want to figure out when this thing equals to zero. So we have a polynomial equation we want to solve here. That's going to solve it by factoring. 
On the left-hand side, I notice I can take out the common divisor of 4x. That's going to be the greatest common divisor. That leaves behind x squared minus 3, um, in which case then if you take the first one, 4x equals 0, that implies x equals 0. If we take x squared minus 3 equals 0, that means x squared equals 3, or x equals plus or minus the square root of 3. And so we're going to, we see that putting these together, there are uh, three places where the function has a horizontal tangent line at 0, at the square root of 3, and at the negative square root of 3, as we can see here illustrated on the graph.